Welcome to World War II Indiana Landmarks, Episode 18, Camp Atterbury. I'm your host, Ron May, author of the book, World War II Indiana Landmarks. For today's episode, we travel south from Indianapolis, down Interstate 65, to reach Edinburgh, Indiana, home of Camp Atterbury. In January 1941, the U.S. War Department considered possible sites in Indiana for an Army training base to handle the influx of trainees that were flooding the Army following the passage of President Roosevelt's Selective Service Act in October 1940. The land near Edinburgh, Indiana, in south-central part of the state, seemed ideal. Like most military installations in the Midwest, the land for the new base was formerly farm fields. Over 40,000 acres of good farmland were spread across the southern part of Johnson County and the northern parts of Bartholomew and Brown counties. Drama and heartache ensued as farms, farmhouses, schools, churches, cemeteries, and even a small town of 13 residents were swallowed up by the government land acquisitions throughout 1941. It cost the government almost $4 million and resulted in the dislocation of 500 farm families. The base was named Camp Atterbury to honor Indiana native General William Wallace Atterbury for his distinguished service as Director of Transportation of the American Expeditionary Forces during the First World War. Construction for the base began in February 1942 and continued for six months. Army plans called for building facilities to train a full Army division, some 40,000 soldiers. When completed, the expansive camp included 1,780 buildings and provided housing to 44,000 officers and soldiers, including 500 enlisted men's barracks, 40 bachelor officer quarters, 23 wax barracks, 61 prisoner of war barracks, 193 mess halls, 12 chapels, 5 service clubs, 3 officers clubs, 6 theaters, 4 gymnasiums, four swimming pools and one hospital and convalescent center. Even before construction was completed, the newly reactivated 83rd Infantry Division reported to Camp Atterbury in August 1942 and became the first Army Division to train at the military installation. By this point, the base consisted of over 1,700 buildings and had already cost $86 million. Following their training at Camp Atterbury, the 83rd Thunderbolt Division departed for Europe in April 1944 and saw combat service in France, Luxembourg, and Germany. Three more divisions trained at Camp Atterbury from 1942 to 1944. The 92nd Buffalo Soldiers Division arrived in October 1942 and eventually was sent to serve in the Italian campaign. The 30th Old Hickory Division reported in November 1943 and was quickly sent to England two months later to begin the buildup for the Normandy invasion. Finally, the 106th Golden Lions Division arrived at Atterbury in February 1944 and ten months later found themselves fighting for their lives during the surprise attack of German forces in the Belgium forest, the Battle of the Bulge. They lost almost 9,000 casualties in the first month of that battle. Throughout the war, close to 275,000 men in more than 100 military units trained for combat at Camp Atterbury, while thousands of other soldiers came for advanced training. While Camp Atterbury was training soldiers for combat, the station hospital on in March 1944, the War Department announced that Atterbury Hospital was to become a general hospital for treating the wounded from overseas combat. This meant expanding the footprint of the hospital and creating fields of specialists to include burn treatment, neurology, orthopedics, and plastic surgery. One of the Army surgeons meeting the wounded at Wakeman General Hospital was Truman G. Blocker, Jr. Blocker, 
shown at the right, reported the Wakeman General Hospital in the summer of 1944, just before the wounded began arriving from Normandy, and became chief of plastic surgery and later chief of surgery. His revolutionary medical skill combined with his effective administrative gifts proved equal to the challenges of a hospital that grew from 2,000 patients to 6,000 patients, and from treating colds, illnesses, and basic injuries to treating severe burns, orthopedic injuries, and others from the battlefield. Blocker made a national name for himself and the hospital. He and his medical team were so successful in treating the burned and injured with plastic surgery that upon his discharge, he was awarded the Legion of Merit, an award rarely given and almost never to a medical officer. The capacity for patients at Wakeman General Hospital reached 10,000 in early 1945 and remained at that level until the end of the war with Japan in September 1945. In the short span of 17 months, April 1944 through August 1945, over 85,000 wounded patients received their medical care at Wakeman. Not only were lives saved, but thousands of soldiers disfigured by war received specialized plastic surgery, allowing them to return to their homes more whole than, what they, than when they first left the battlefield. Following the war's conclusion, Wakeman General Hospital continued treating patients until it was closed at the end of 1946 by the War Department. A few of the original buildings of Wakeman General Hospital are still standing today on the north side of Hospital Road, uh, just to the other side of the main base at Camp Atterbury. For the last 80 years, nature has progressively been reclaiming both the ground and the structures of the former Wakeman Hospital. Less than a year after opening, Camp Atterbury constructed an internment camp for prisoners of war. Built on 45 acres west of the main training area, the camp held 3,000 prisoner, prisoners in a secure compound of 100 buildings surrounded by a stockade and barbed wire. The first prisoners arriving at Camp Atterbury in April 1943 were Italian soldiers who had fought in North Africa and surrendered to the Allies near Tunis. By September, the prison population had reached its capacity at 3,000 men, mostly Italians. Many of the POWs were loaned to local area farmers to help with planting and harvesting. The Italian POWs were glad to be able to get off the prison compound and serve as lab laborers out in the community. One of the POWs was responsible for the famous rock at Camp Atterbury. The rock was carved over three months during the summer by Liber Libero Puccini, who has lived from 1924 to 2008. He was one of the Italian POWs. After carving the eponymous rock at the base entrance, Puccini said, we could have done it in three days, but we did it over three months. We wanted to stay here. People were bringing us drinks. The prisoners' new home at the internment camp included relatively comfortable sleeping, dining, and recreational areas. What it didn't have was a chapel. The Italian prisoners sought to build one with the encouragement from their Roman Catholic chaplain, Father Maurice Imhoff. They received permission from the camp's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel John Gamble, to create a chapel from the materials that were left over from the camp's original construction. The prisoners, many of whom were skilled workers and artisans back home, erected an 11 by 16 foot chapel. They built the shell of the chapel from brick and stucco and painted it a Mediterranean blue. They made a gable roof and adorned it with a cross. The floor was constructed to look like the terracotta tile from their homeland by putting lines in the concrete in the shape of squares and painting it red. Artisans painted detailed frescoes on the walls and the ceiling. The chapel was completed and dedicated to the Blessed Mother in the summer of 1943, christened the Chapel in the Meadow. Although it was humble in size, the 11 by 16 foot three-sided structure provided a roof over Chaplain Imhoff as he, held, as he led Mass 
and it became a sacred place for worship and a symbol of hope for the prisoners living so far from home. Here they could come on their free time for private reflection, prayer for their loved ones back home, and to thank God that they had survived the war. The sacred space was also a touch of home for the prisoners, with its Italian-style blue stucco walls and its Italian-inspired artwork and the frescoes. The chapel helped connect the prisoners to the religion and culture of their native homeland. In June 1946, the prison compound was torn down. The only building left intact was the chapel in the meadow, spared only through the efforts of the wife of the commander in charge of the demolition and a resale of the, of the camp. As years went by, the chapel was neglected and eventually fell into a state of disrepair. It was finally restored in 1988 by the Indiana National Guard at a cost of $30,000. It remains today at its original, but now isolated, location upon a serene grassy area shaded by large trees around its perimeter. Visitors can walk up to the open side of the chapel, which is now covered with plexiglass, and look in at the chancel, once created by the hands and hearts of the Italian POWs. Following World War II, Camp Atterbury was inactivated. It was reactivated during the Korean and Vietnam conflicts. In September 1976, the base became an Army National Guard training site and continued in that capacity until the 1990s. Today, Camp Atterbury is used by active and reserve forces of all branches from around the country to train and to prepare for mobilization. Camp Atterbury also has a museum. It is part of the Welcome Center just east of the main gate on Old Hospital Road. The items on display, including photos, papers, uniforms, and artifacts, preserve the history of the base as well as the former hospital and POW camp. There are also displays tracing the history of each Army division that trained at Camp Atterbury during World War II as well as information on the other military units that trained here. On the other side of the road from the Welcome Center and just west, there's an outdoor area that displays military vehicles and some weapons from World War II. In the center of the viewing area is a soldier statue and a veteran's memorial wall. The World War II soldier is on a pedestal and overlooking a water feature with a fountain. Behind him on the wall are the seals, titles, and information on the divisions and other units that once trained there at Camp Atterbury. The soldier's right arm is down at his side, holding his carbine rifle. His left arm is outstretched, with his hand pointing forward, perhaps toward the combat theaters that the men have trained for and were soon to enter. In front of the soldier is a reflecting pool and fountain that draw attention to the memorial and invite visitors to pause and consider the many thousands who, after training at Camp Atterbury, courageously headed off to war. A walkway of memorial bricks wraps around the water feature. Learn more about Camp Atterbury and those who served there in my new book, World War II Indiana Landmarks, available for purchase on my website or wherever books are sold. And while on my website, check out my trilogy of Indiana World War II service stories. Thanks for tuning in to this episode.